J ハット塾。We gotta count how many six-digit numbers we can make from this. Now, there is a quick formula for this. The number of ways that this can be arranged to to give us a number. So we only have to arrange this differently, right? For example, if if we have this arrangement one two two three three three, that's already a six digit number. Then we just have to rearrange that. Let's say two one two three three three. So by rearranging the order, by rearranging the digits, we get a new six digit number. But of course. If we rearrange two and two, these two, if we interchange them, you'll notice that we'll get the same six-digit number, right? So we we should not count those rearrangements. And there's an easy formula for this to know how many unique rearrangements we can get. So what we do is we just compute that first, all those permutations, and then we divide by the factorial. Of how many repetitions we have. So in this case, in our problem, we get the number of permutations for six, six digits taken six at a time. So that's six p six. Now we divide it by how many times each of the digits repeat the factorial of the, of that. Okay. So one repeats only once, and so that we divide this by one factorial. Two repeats twice, so we divide this by two factorial. Three repeats thrice. So again, we divide that with three factorial. Now, this six p six, we already know that to be six factorial. So this number here, six factorial divided by the difference, six minus six, six minus six, and the factorial of that. Okay, and then this denominator, we just bring them here, just so we can see the numbers more clearly. Now, the six factorial here is retained, six minus six is zero, so zero factorial. And, and then <clears throat> we have here, um, one factorial is just one, two factorial is two times once, so you get two here. Three factorial is two times, uh, is three times two times one, so that's six, okay? Now, zero factorial is actually one, and six factorial, can be factored into six times five factorial. And here we have just two and six. Now the sixes cancel, we are left with five factorial divided by two and that gives us 60. That means there are 60 unique rearrangements of this set of digits. J hat to juku. We are given the following sequence, negative five, negative two, one, up until 28. The problem is, what is the sum of, of all these numbers in the sequence? So we got to add negative five to negative two to one and so on up to 28. We just use the formula for arithmetic series. And that is the sum of all the terms up to n, okay, it's just the one, it's just a half of n, where n here is the number of terms. So you count how many, how many numbers we have all in all here, and then multiply that with the first term. In this case, we've got negative five plus the last term, which is 28. So basically this is saying, what we do first is we get the average of the first term and the last term, the average is, is already one half times a1 plus a n. So that's the average of the first term and the last term. And then we multiply that average with how many number of terms we have, okay? That's n. So we need to find, here we already know a1, a sub one and a sub n. So we only need to find n. How many terms do we have here all in all, okay? And to do that, we just use this, this formula for the arithmetic series. This tells us that the nth term of the arithmetic series, or rather arithmetic sequence, is the first term plus the product of the common difference times n minus one, where n is the number of terms. Now we know a sub one, so that's okay. We also know d. 
okay? We also know a sub n, okay? a sub n is the, is the nth term, which is 28. a sub 1 is negative 5. That's the first term. And d is the common difference, which is just how much do we add every time we get the next term? So, so negative 5, negative 2, we get 3, okay? 3, we added 3. Negative 2 to 1, we also added 3. So 3 is the common difference here. Now we can solve for n in here, okay? So we just replace that there. That's 28, a sub one is minus five and d is three. And if you do this, we get 12, okay? So there are 12 terms all in all. Now that we know n, we can now use this formula again, okay? So n here is 12, so that's s sub 12. Now we got one half, we get 12 here. Now, first term is negative five, last term is 28. You do this math and we get 138. That means that the total number, that the total sum, the sum of, of all the terms here is 138. <laughs> The problem gives us three points that are collinear. That means they are all in the same line, points A, B, and C in here. Now, what we're looking for is X and Y. So what we do here is we use the fact that they are all collinear because if they're collinear, then this equation here holds. What this is telling us is that we can have some, some point X, O, Y, O, Z, O, okay? And two other points, X1, Y1, Z1, and X2, Y2, Z2. And if we have those, this relationship holds, okay? You notice what we have here is that we have all the X sub O's here, okay? That's one point. X sub O's, Y sub O's, Z sub O's. And then the one of the points will be X2, Y2, Z2. And the other point is X1, Y1, Z1. Okay. So we just need this. This one contains two equations already, two independent equations. And so what we'll do is we'll use those two independent equations to find these two unknowns, X and Y. Okay. Now we notice that with these three points, we can actually just use the first point, 1, 3, and minus 2 for x, y, and z. Rather, for x, o, y, o, and z, z, o, uh, because that means that the second terms here will have constant numbers, okay? And we will want x and y to be the first part of these things here. Okay, and now uh, let's actually extract the two equations that we will need. So after we, we substitute these points into here, again, we said that we're gonna use A as our, our first point, zero point, and then the others, B and C will be our, our, fir, our one and our twos here, okay? So this is how it's gonna look like. What we used here is this is gonna be C, okay, two, so this is x sub two here in y, okay, x sub two. And this is x sub two and where were the other bits? This is y sub two and this is z sub two. Now this is x sub one, y sub one and z sub one, okay? And the rest of the numbers are x sub zero, y sub zero, and z sub zero, okay? So one goes here and here, three goes here and here, minus two goes here and here, okay? And this one, y, one, four comes from this one. And this one, two, x, one comes from this one here, okay? Notice that we can actually simplify this last term here, this is just four plus two, which is six divided by one plus two, which is three. So this, is, this actually simplifies to two, okay? Now what that tells us is that 
Probably we want this for our equation because this is a constant. There are no variables there. So the two independent equations we'll choose are going to be this equals two. That's what we have here. And this equation, this equals two. That's the second equation we have here. Okay. And then we're just going to solve them. So the first one here, actually, that's not very hard to solve because the denominator here is just two minus one, which is one. So we're left with just y minus one equals two. And that is so easy to solve. We get y equals three, okay? Now the second equation from here, we notice that one minus three is actually minus two, right? And you got a two here, so we they can cancel, right? This becomes minus one, and this one is just one, okay? Now, uh, the x minus three is in the denominator. So what we do is we're just gonna get the reciprocal of this side and this side. So the reciprocal of minus one over x minus three is just negative x plus three. And the reciprocal of the other side is just one, okay? And now this is again, easy to solve. So uh, we can solve that easily and we get x equals two. And so these are the answers we're looking for. Here is a function that is cubic. That means it has three as its largest exponent of the unknown. And we are looking for the derivative of f of x then we wanna know how many real roots f of x has. And we also wanna know the definite integ integral of f of x from negative one to one. Let's start with the derivative. To get the derivative of f of x, we just get the derivative of each term and we just add them up. So the derivative, for example, of the first term is just x squared. Derivative of this is negative 4x. Derivative of 4x is just 4, and the derivative of the constant is 0. And so we add them all together. We see that the derivative of f of x is just x squared minus 4x plus 4, or that's actually just the square of x minus 2. Okay. Now, we want to know the number of real roots of f of x. So when we say roots, we mean the number, that is the, the value of x, where the graph of f of x crosses the x-axis. Okay, so this is, if you know how to graph this, this is not very hard to graph. You will immediately see that, so I'm just going to graph it here very quickly. It, the graph is going to look like this. Okay, so what we have here is the x-axis, we get the y-axis, and this is our f of x. So the root of, or the roots of f of x are those values where f of x crosses the x-axis. So for example, this one. And how many times does it cross the x-axis? That is the number of real roots. In this case, we know that it crosses it here, and if you're able to graph it, you're gonna see immediately that it crosses the x-axis only once. And so we only have one real root. Without graphing, we can still tell the number of real roots of f of x, okay? So here, if we don't graph this, what we'll have to do is look at f of x. What is the degree? That is, what is the largest number? It's cubic, so the largest number in the exponent is, is three. Okay, that tells us how many, how many roots in total there are for f of x. So because that's three, then that means that f of x has three roots in total, okay? So it, it, ha it has three roots in total. Now, some of them could be real, some of them imaginary. We are only asked about the real roots, but we know that there are three roots in total, and if you add the number of real roots and the number of imaginary roots, they should always add up to three. 
Okay. Now, the imaginary roots, we know in advance that in any case, imaginary roots always come in pairs. Okay. You cannot have just one imaginary root. They have to be pairs. So you could have zero imaginary roots. You could have two imaginary roots. You could have four imaginary roots, but wait a minute. We said that there are only three roots here, so we cannot have four imaginary roots. We could only have either zero or two imaginary roots. Now, if we fill out this table, we will also know that because there are, if there are zero imaginary roots, then there could only be three real roots, right? Because the total has to be three for the cubic equation here. Now, if there are two imaginary roots, there could only be one real root so that when you add them, you still get three, a total of three roots. And so our, our choices really for the real roots, the number of real roots is just either three or one. Now, we said that the roots of, a, of a, an expression of a polynomial is the number of times it crosses the x-axis in here, right? So if it, if it has three real roots, then it crosses the x-axis three times, okay? That's the only way you could, you could have three real roots, right? Because the roots are the numbers that where the graph crosses the x-axis. So to cross this three times, then your graph has to wiggle. It has to do one. Okay, let's do that again. The graph has to wiggle, all right? So let me just draw that again. So it has to cross it once, then it has to wiggle up again to cross it twice, and then it has to wiggle back, okay? To cross it a third time. Any other possibility is, is okay, as long as it, it crosses the x-axis thrice. That's when we have three real roots. And what that means is it really has to wiggle. Now we just need to know whether our f of x here wiggles. We can know that from the derivative. If the derivative of the function has, um, is, is always positive or zero everywhere, then it doesn't wiggle. It just goes up, 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 up like that. If the derivative of f of x is either negative or zero everywhere, then it also doesn't wiggle. It just goes down, so on, right? So what that tells us is that if the sign of the derivative of f of x does not change at all, right? If, it's, if it stays positive or zero, or if it stays negative or zero, then it does not wiggle. And that's, a good, that's a good thing to know because we know that the derivative of our given is x minus two squared. It's got a squared. That means it's always positive or zero. Therefore, it doesn't wiggle. The graph of f of x does not wiggle. And that means it cannot be three. The real roots cannot be three. It could only be one, okay? So we say that we have only one real root for f of x. Now, the third one here is just to find the definite integral from negative one to one, okay? So uh, just like the derivative case, all we need to do is find the definite integral of each of the terms here, okay? So we, we do that one by one, and then we add them all together. Now, the limit of, the limits of integration is negative one to one. So that's a really nice limit because it's the same number of, of is the same number to the left of zero and to the right of zero, okay? When we have something like this, there are a few shortcuts, right? If we know that our function is, is odd, for example, the first term here is odd, right? It's cubed. So if it's odd, and if you integrate from negative one to one or from any number from negative a to a, it's odd. The integral will be zero because what that means is that there will be a positive area 
and a negative area and they cancel out. And the first term here is odd, is, a, is an odd function. And so the integral that we're looking for there is zero. The third term here is also an odd function. So that's also zero. So we're left with the second and, and the fourth term. The second term is an even function. Because it's an even function, we don't even have to, to integrate from negative one to one. We just need to integrate from zero to one. And then whatever the value there, we double that and we get the integral of this thing here, okay? So that's what we'll do. One here is also an even function. So we will do the same thing. So we'll do the first one here. So we, we do twice, right? We said, well, we're gonna double and then the integral of this thing. So that's the integral of that is, is negative two thirds x cubed from zero to one, okay? Because we're gonna double. Notice we're gonna double already, so we don't have to, to make this negative one. It says we, we can start with zero. And we just replace that x cubed. So one cubed is just one, zero cubed is one, is zero. And so you simplify that, you get negative four thirds. And we do the same thing here. Again, we double, and then the integral of dx is just x. Replace that with one minus zero, so you just get two. Now we add them all together, negative four thirds plus two, you get two thirds. And so the integral that we're looking for is just two thirds.